Hello, I'm Dale Leftwich with Real Agriculture. Today I have Tamar Haspel, with a columnist with the Washington Post. She writes a monthly column called Unearthed. Uh, how are you doing today, Tamar? I am just fine, Dale. How's everything up in Saskatoon? <laughs> it's really good. You were up in Saskatoon. Uh, I was up in Saskatoon, and I know you guys are sick of hearing sissies from the States complain about the cold, but it was actually kind of beautiful. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, we actually, you know, we never grow tired of that. And so we, we, like, and we like to brag about how tough we are to live in this, in this temperature. <laughs> uh, you were a, a, a bunch of, uh, amongst a bunch of farmers at the Farm and Food Care Conference, and farmers and uh, and agricultural communicators. Uh, you yourself are a, are a farmer. You have an oyster farm. I do. My husband and I have a small oyster farm here on Cape Cod. Right. And um, you've been involved in v um, various aspects of uh, the agriculture debate, if I could put it that way. You are a producer. You actually you like to hunt. Like you you uh, also are uh, involved in nutrition. And you've also been involved in the Food Evolution a movie, I think. Yes, I was. I had a little cameo appearance there. One of the things that I, because I've been following you for a little while, one of the things that intrigues me about, about your approach, uh, you... Uh, you approach things without a team. Like there is usually a, a team GMO or a team anti-GMO, mm -hmm. and uh, you don't really have a team. You really do pursue uh, what you what you would say is the truth. You know, like and you and you're willing to f to be flexible about that. But that's is it lonely to be kind of you get attacked from all sides? I think. I do get attacked from all sides. And, you know, when, when I defend organic agriculture, I'm anti-science. And when I defend GMOs, I'm an industry shill. Sometimes you just can't win. On the other hand, um, I think, you know, I'm temperamentally just, I've never been much of a joiner. And I think in some ways, maybe that serves, serves me in good stead. I harbor no illusions that, that you know, I can dig through everything that's out there and come to the absolute ironclad truth. But I, I do my best and I deliberately try not to, you know, have an allegiance with any position or other. In fact, I kind of do the opposite. So when I have a position on something, I try and spend time with the smartest people who disagree with me because I think that's the best way to make sure you don't crawl down your own ideological rabbit hole because we all have them. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, that's that's not talked about enough, I mean, people talk about you know, polarization and people taking sides, but people often form their opinions based on who their friends are. So if you have friends who are, uh, who are, if you're in the middle West, Midwest and your friends come from a certain area, you want to support your friends. And it's very difficult not to simply, it's the downside of loyalty. Like loyalty is a great thing, but if you're loyal, more loyal to your friends than you are to uh, finding the truth, I think it causes problems. Like how do you overcome that? Well, I think it's important to note that while we do often end up taking the same positions as, you know, friends or communities or tribes or, you know, people who share our values, it's not so much that we make the decision, okay, these are our friends, we're going to be loyal. It's that, you know, we have these diabolical cognitive mechanisms that make sure that we sort of see the merits of the argument of people who share our values and not so much people who don't. And so it, you know, and it's hard to break out of that. But in some ways, you, you have to acknowledge that for a lot of people, there's no real reason you should. And, and Dan Kahan at Yale makes this point all the time that, you know, if you're just an person making a decision about, say, genetically modified food, your opinion about genetically modified food and whether you eat it or you don't is not going to have any real implications for your life. But whether you fit in with your group of friends or, you know, you 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 take a position that they don't agree with you, with it, which could cause friction, that does have implications for your life. So it's not all this, you know, we should all uh, sit down and try and see the facts clearly. Although as a journalist, that's sort of, that's my responsibility, but you know, it is a little more complex than that. 
So one of the, one of the, you talked about the things like cognitive di dissonance and, and sort of uh, like how that works. Uh, but one other thing that you talked about is just this idea over and over again, we hear from people, well, if we could only educate the other side, whatever that is. But you talked about how, in fact, uh, understanding science and understanding education actually do not uh, guarantee that people will come to the same conclusions. Yeah, not only do science and education not protect you from confirmation bias, which is, you know, the, the, the mechanism by which we find evidence that supports our position and dismiss evidence which doesn't. It turns out that people who are more scientifically literate and better educated, at least on some issues, are more likely to be polarized, not less likely to be polarized. And part of that is, <coughs> excuse me, if you're well educated, you may have more confidence in your opinion um, and and not just in your opinion, but in your ability to parse evidence. But the reality is humans, all of us, are bad at doing that. It's just not what humans evolved to do. We, we evolved in an absence of data, and our decision-making apparatus is optimized for the personal, for, for the value-driven, for the community. Um, and and it's, it's, it's hard to get beyond that, and science and education don't really help you. So these are some evolutionary uh, hangovers, I guess, in, in many is where you describe, describe them. Uh, people have evolved to have a certain defense against certain enemies, and, and that defense doesn't necessarily help us in terms of, uh, of, of having a, an independent mind. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I would put it quite that way, but but yeah, these are these are certainly um, our evolutionary legacy. The way that we make decisions, just as you know, it's so much else is is our evolutionary legacy. Humans survived through millennia that had very very different. Uh, circumstances than the ones that, that we're looking at now in the modern world. And not everything that adapted to get us through those millennia um, is is 100% uh, perfect uh, for modernity. Yeah. So I, I guess one of the things that, that, again, another pitfall we fall into or what people fall into when they're trying to explain things is this idea that knowledge on any certain topic will will lead you to the truth, where uh, in most cases, people just simply don't have, the average person doesn't have enough information about, say, climate change to really make a, a, an educated decision, or, uh, or in some, even maybe even vaccines. I mean, we can kind of assume that science has come to a consensus. So I think what you were talking about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the idea of teaching critical thinking as opposed to teaching independent like individual science subjects is that fair um i i wouldn't no no i, <laughs> I don't think that that really characterizes my position because i'm certainly in favor of science education mm -hmm. um and and i I just think that humans, all of us, have to come to grips with the fact that we're not excellent reason, excellent parsers of evidentiary data, and that we do make our decisions on things other than facts. And I think being aware of that, being persuaded of that, can help you uh, avoid maybe some of the worst excesses of, of confirmation bias and motivated reasoning. Um, but, you know, none of us will ever be immune to it. I just, I think it's something that we need to be aware of. Okay. Uh, one of, another thing that you talked about is this idea of shared values. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how, how things like shared values actually can be more persuasive? Well, sure. And, you know, it, in the food world, you have... Uh, t basically two, um, I'm going to call them size for lack of a better word. You have the sort of the, the conventional ag as we know it's status quo uh, production efficiency side. And then you have the smaller environmentally conscious um, uh, diversity organic side. 
and you know nobody is perfectly on one side or the other but i think it breaks down on that roughly but here's the thing both of the both of these sides all of the people i've met on on both sides are interested in feeding the world responsibly and yet this this comes down to a shouting match about the various different techniques and the ups and downs and the trade-offs and there always are trade-offs in agriculture and we don't talk a lot about some of the very fundamental things that we share um you know i've never met a farmer who didn't want to reduce his environmental impact um i've never met uh a uh an, an activist and who who has questions about or is skeptical of conventional ag, who doesn't want to be able to produce enough food to feed the world, and it seems to me that that this is sort of a microcosm of larger disagreements. I think that there are there is more value driven common ground than than we usually acknowledge. So just following up on that, you actually, um, there were a lot of scientists, science communicators in the room uh, at the Farm and Food Care Conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there were, you could see light bulbs going on like all throughout the entire room when, when you, were, you, you were giving some of the pointers that you, that you were that you were giving. Do you want to like outline a couple of those? Like the idea of you, you said about uh, the, the other person's strongest argument, like understanding those kinds of mm -hmm. things. Well, for me, the key to try and check my own bias and make sure that I'm trying to see these things as clearly as I can is really other people. And so when I have an issue to examine, the first thing I do is find the smartest person I can who disagrees with me and I listen. Um, in a more general way, I try and spend time in rooms with people who have different points of view. Um, I have, you know, social media that is populated with people of widely different views. And I, I try to really pay attention to what the arguments are, not just so I know what they are, so I can refute them, but to really try and give them credence. And I try to approach every issue as though this is something I could be wrong about. And if I'm wrong about it, I want to know. And that kind of helps me go into it with, with a genuine spirit of inquiry um, with at least as much sense that I could be persuaded as I could persuade somebody else. Well, I think that that spirit of inquiry is is apparent in in what you do, and I I really was quite uh, intrigued by the way you started off the 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 presentation that you had. You asked if anybody had changed their mind recently, like in the last year. You want to go over that a little bit? Yeah, well, I I, I ask that question a lot because I think mind changing is is an indication of open mindedness and 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 a willingness to examine one's own positions. And so, you know, I give this talk a lot, and I always ask audiences, well, when was the last time you changed your mind? Because we all go out in the world sort of thinking, you know, we're going to persuade other people. We're going to change other people's minds. But the infrequency with which we change our own minds on issues of substance is sort of an indication of just how difficult that is to do. So I like to ask the question because it, it brings that point home and it sort of sets the stage for having a conversation about mind changing. So it, just, to, just to kind of uh, uh, illuminate this a little bit, uh, how many people put up their hands so that they'd actually changed their oh, minds that, in the last year? There were only a few. And I, <laughs> I actually, I called on one guy and, and he was reluctant, but he told me what it was, what he changed his mind about. It was about building a barn. And then when I asked for other people to share their stories, there was not a single person. And there were 150 people in that room. So changing your mind is not a common practice, but yet that's the kind of thing that we're asking other people to do. So a little introspection in terms of this probably is very helpful. Yeah, well, I find it so. Uh, gee, I, I just want to uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, for being with us today. Tamar Haspel, uh, yes, is a is a columnist with uh, with the Washington Post. Uh, thank you very much, Tamar. Thank you, Dale.